Welcome friends. In part three of the cam phaser series, I'm finally getting to the phasers themselves and the rest of the timing components that I'm replacing as preventative maintenance. I needed to get the engine to top dead center and apparently there's a trick with an extension and cylinder one spark plug hole, but I just rotated the crankshaft clockwise until the arrows on the cam phasers pointed in the appropriate directions, which is mostly up. And the crankshaft sprocket locating notch is at the 11 o'clock with the dimple at around the 4 o'clock position. When I got close, I set the special cam locating tools in place and slowly rotated the crankshaft until they mostly fell into place. I had to go slow because if I passed the spot then I'd have to rotate the chains all the way around again two full times. On bank one, the, the passenger side, it fell right in, but the bank two tool wouldn't lock in due to a misaligned intake cam. Earlier while rotating the crankshaft, this cam phaser's sprocket would spring back and forth randomly, so I'm sure that this was the bad phaser. To get them to lock in, I used a TP55 Torx Plus to rotate the camshaft until the flat sides lined up with the locating tool and both tools sat flat against their respective heads. Now I could start removing the timing components, starting with the Bank 1 chain guide, using an 8mm socket and ratchet to remove the two bolts at the top and middle, and then just pull, off, pull it off the pin at the bottom. Next was removing the tensioner with an 8mm socket to remove the two bolts that hold it on. The plastic tensioner arm is not bolted in, I just had to pull it off the upper pin while moving the chain out of the way. Then I could just pull the whole chain off. Now I could repeat the process on bank 2, pulling off the guide, then the tensioner, then the tensioner arm, and then the chain. Onto the phasers themselves, I used the TP55 Torx Plus bit to try and loosen the cam phaser bolts while holding down the cam locating tool. I was not successful with a breaker bar, so I went straight to an impact, as the TP55 that I was using was an impact bit. This did not work, and I started stripping the inside of the bolts. I was using the new Milwaukee M12, which has up to 550 pounds of breakaway torque. I thought maybe I needed more torque, so I switched to my Ryobi, which has only about 100 pounds more, but that didn't work either. And uh, at this point, I was terrified that I wouldn't get them all out. I pulled the airbox to get more room and tried using a three quarter inch ratchet and full length jack arm to try and loosen it, but I didn't have any luck. I even jumped into the engine bay to ensure that there was no deflection, but they just wouldn't come out. After wallowing in self-pity and uh, taking some selfies, I found a forum where several people said that they had to use bolt extractors. So after scouring the internet for local availability, I ran to a Napa Auto Parts about 20 minutes away and grabbed two extractor sets, which you know, either one of them could have had the right size. I tried the 11 16s first, since it was uh, larger. I hammered it on made sure the impact was in reverse, and the bolt just came right out. Ho oh, ho! <laughs> oh God. I just got way too excited about that. I removed the rest of the bolts and out came the phasers. Before installing new timing components, I needed to clean the timing cover, mating surfaces, uh, which is the block, the heads, uh, and also on the cover itself. I put gasket remover over everything and tried using a rubber wheel and then a nylon wire wheel to remove the gasket. Ultimately, I had to use a combo of a razor blade and the nylon wire wheel. 
Only later did I read the Ford service manual instructions, which actually say to use a 120 grit Rolock bristle disc with uh, with the gas gasket remover also. I put a link in the description, but you can just Google it and find the best price option or location if you need one. Anyway, three hours later, I finished and I started prepping the cover by replacing all of the seals on it. I removed the coolant tube seal with a one in five sixteenth socket and hammer, making sure to protect the timing cover with wood underneath. The oil pump sensor seal I removed with a 22 millimeter socket and the crankshaft seal I removed using a rented bearing removal tool. For installation, I used the same tool uh, with different parts to install the crankshaft seal. The coolant tube seal I did by hand. I could just push it in there. But the oil pump sensor seal, I needed to use a 27 millimeter socket to install. I estimated the depth, but it would have been much more useful to actually take photos uh, of the old ones first to compare later. The block and head surfaces took me about two hours to clean, being careful not to let anything fall into the oil pan or any other passages. If I wasn't replacing the tensioners, then I'd also need to prep them for installation using a vise, needle nose pliers, and a bit of thick wire or a finishing nail. I'd start to compress the plunger, uh, then use the pliers to squeeze together the locking ring while continuing to compress the plunger until the plunger's shoulder passes the hole. Then throw the wire in there to lock it into place. So now I could start replacing the timing components, starting with the cam oil control solenoids. This was just preventative maintenance for me, just to have the confidence uh, in that part for longevity. These are all the same part, so I just pulled out the old ones using an 8mm socket and ratchet and installed the new ones, torquing the bolts to 89 inch pounds. Next I installed the new phasers, also known as the variable camshaft timing sprockets. The phasers go on with a pin that slides into a notch on the camshaft end. It should be common sense, but I double checked that the intake phasers marked with an I went on the inside, and the exhaust phasers marked with a lowercase e went on the outside camshafts. The torquing on this seemed straightforward, but I didn't realize how much effort it would actually take. Stage one was 30 foot-pounds, Stage two was loosening it 360 degrees. Stage three was 18 foot pounds. And then mother of God, stage four was 150 degrees. This was a little stressful because I was worried I'd either strip out the bolt head with the Torx Plus or that it would just pop out and I'd hit myself in the face. Neither one of those things happened, so I just knocked them all out. I replaced the crankshaft sprocket next, needing to pull off the old bolt that I was using to rotate the cylinders. Then I could slide off the old sprocket and then just slide the new one on. The sprocket is keyed and it's reversible, so it was very easy to replace with confidence. Next came the new Bank 2 chain with the yellow link on the passenger side and the copper link on the driver side, both lining up with the intake and exhaust sprocket markings. On the crankshaft sprocket, Two colored links straddled the dimple. Next, I added the new tension arm, sliding it onto the pin at the top and over the chain. I then threw on the new Bank 2 tensioner, which has the Bank 1 chain guide pin integrated into the driver's side bolt. I torqued the bolts to 89 inch pounds. Then came the new Bank 2 chain guide, which slides onto the lower pin and bolts in with two bolts torqued at 89 inch-pounds. I then verified that the cam phaser arrows lined up with the colored links still, and also the crankshaft sprocket dimple was between the two lower colored links. Then I could release the tensioner pin and check everything again. 
The Bank 1 parts go on very much the same, but I wrestled with it a bit since the timing marks, they just wouldn't stay aligned. I ended up realizing that I had to reinstall the old crankshaft bolt and rotate it slightly to get the chain on properly. I was still left with a bit of slack on the Bank 1 chain, but I rotated the crank until everything aligned again and the tensioners had picked up the slack appropriately, shifting from one side to the other by bank. And the important thing is that all of the timing marks still lined up. Now I could install the timing cover, which I was terrified to do. I prefer like metal and rubber gaskets to RTV, but I bought the Ford RTV. I also bought a Permatext little baby caulking gun and some M8 by 1.25 70 millimeter bolts to make into guide pins. The Ford service manual has an actual tool part number for those guide pins, but I wasn't gonna pay $80 for them because they're basically just bolts. I installed the makeshift guides into their respective location according to the manual, and then I test fit the cover as practice for installation. The alternator wiring gets in the way pretty bad, so I zip tied it down to the steering rack. I looped up the inside of the timing cover seals with fresh oil, and I could finally do the thing for real. I only had four minutes to add RTV to all the mounting surfaces on the timing cover, including the interior bolt holes, and doubling up on the RTV on the oil pan and head mating locations. The bead is supposed to be a consistent four millimeter width and the double up locations add an additional five and a half millimeter width. In practice, I realized that I could not get the, the angle right from, you know, all the way around. So I put it on cardboard and then I was able to rotate the timing cover halfway through and finish up all of the RTV. With the timing cover on, I followed the manual's torquing procedure, which I wrote on the bolt holder that I made. Starting with the six primary bolts, torquing them to 27 inch-pounds. Then pulling out the alignment bolts that I had made and installing and torquing uh, all 24 bolts first to 177 inch-pounds in the correct order, and then restarting the order and doing an additional 45 degrees. Before cutting the zip ties off, I installed the wire retainer stud and ensured that then I cut off the zip ties, clipped the driver side retainer on, put the passenger side retaining bracket back onto the stud and tightened down the nut. So, final thoughts are that this required a few special tools to get done. The first being the camshaft locating and holding tool 303-1655. The Ford part is just a, a single tool that you have to alternate on both banks. But these can be found on Amazon with two pieces, uh, as well as the Torx Plus 55 bit. That TP55, which came in the kit, is garbage and was likely the reason that the phaser bolt stripped out when it started to twist. I had to order a new non-impact TP55 overnight to install the new bolts. Obviously, I needed the 11 16th extractor and was very lucky that the main local Napa auto store was nearby and that they actually had it in stock. This project also required me to use three different torque wrenches based on the various torque that's required. I needed a, a quarter inch wrench, a three eighths, and a large half inch wrench. I wish that I had read the instructions earlier and bought a Rolock disc to clean the timing cover. But honestly, I, I think now that I should have 
just bought a new timing cover altogether. It took me three hours to clean it, and I'd rather have just paid the $130 for a new one instead. Though I, I don't think that the new ones come with seals. The small caulking gun from Permatex was important for me so that I'd have more control when running that RTV bead. The guide pins were very helpful in making sure that the cover went on straight and was held in place while I installed the bolts. I spent hours cross-referencing part numbers and I wasn't sure what I should replace and what I shouldn't. I mainly started my want list based off of a Ford Tech Make You Locos video. The point being that if you take the truck into Ford for warranty replacement, they will likely only replace the broken parts, so you'll end up with one or two new phasers and everything else will just stay the same. If it's under warranty, then you can usually pay more to have them replace the parts that you want with no change to the labor, but the parts will likely have a dealer markup. I am happy that I chose to replace all the timing components as preventative maintenance. When I finished installing the last parts onto bank one and started rotating the crankshaft, I was surprised to notice that the tensioners were alternating as it cycled. I didn't remember it doing that before, so I panicked a little bit until I found a YouTube video showing that it's normal. I should have paid more attention before. The Ford RTV with a four minute set time is wild and it was very stressful. I rehearsed a, a couple times before actually doing it. The time between the start of this video and the end was almost exactly two days from afternoon to afternoon two days later. I kept having to run to Napa, O'Reilly's, or Home Depot to get things that I didn't know that I needed, like the nylon wire wheel, bolt extractor, and caulking gun. So at the end of this part of the project, I'm three and a half days in, with 23 hours of actual work. Anywho, that's all I've got. The last part will cover reassembly and I'll point out some upgrades that I purchased also. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.